<laughs> sure you can. You survived before me, you'll survive after me. I've got a great team, though, for on the program committee. I know they're going to get you, continue to get you wonderful, exciting speakers, such as the one today, Michael Lord. Many, many of you have heard his previous programs. And Michael earned his BS and his MS degrees in atmospheric science from the University of Washington, along with being a research meteorologist there. He worked for 30 years with the National Weather Service. He has authored, co-authored, or served as editor of 21 creationist books and has published over 200 related articles in creation technical literature. His articles written on the Ice Age floods may be found at his website, michaelords.net. And Michael, that is Michael Ords, like plural, dot net? Yeah, michael.ords.net. So, for some great, interesting information this morning, welcome to Michael Ord. Well, good morning. I, it's good to be here because I know a good amount of you. And it's good to reacquaint after a year or two. Anyway, um, I, I'm, my official uh, learning is in atmospheric science, but I've gone into geology for uh, some reasons which I'm going to show you. I, you know, I get undercurrents from people, creationists, that mm, geology is not all that important. We should stick with evolution. Oh, but there's a lot more to the story. So uh, as an introduction to this talk, which is ocean sediments and incredible new flood developments, I'm going to make a case that uh, the importance of uh, flood geology, as we call it. The reason it's important is because geology brought in uniformitarianism way back in the late 1700s when they knew hardly anything about geology. And then uniformitarianism, which is slow processes over millions of years, the present is the key to the past, brought in millions of years. You know, and that's logical because, of course, if you looked at a, a cliff like Grand Canyon, it would take millions of years to form those layers at the rate we see uh, deposition going on today. Both resulted in evolution starting in 1859. Both. They underpin evolution. All contradict the Bible. And accepting them into the church has greatly fueled liberalism in the church. Starting in the early 1800s, before evolution, they, they jammed the millions of years into the Bible. The gap theory, the day age theory, and now there's other offshoots of those ideas. And the cultures paid tremendously for these beliefs. There's a lot of beliefs in evolution that were just risen animals. And so if you believe that, man, it's almost uh, the sky's the limit for all the strange things you can dream up, like the master race uh, concept that Hitler put into practice. So geology undergirds all that. And geology is the major verification of evolution in deep time the millions of years. Biology easily verifies creation. And like, for instance, any feature in biology is so complex that the idea that it evolved from chance and time mutations, natural selection, really doesn't work. Besides, they can't, under, they can't explain the origin of life from chemicals. And then they say that the real record of, of change in evolution is in the fossil record. But the fossil record is composed of gaps, universal gaps, showing you don't see one creature evolving into another. So there's just a lot of reasons in biology which, to me, easily verifies creation. But geology undergirds all this stuff and holds it together. And geology also has a lot of challenges. A lot of challenges to the Bible. The reason I know this is because I try to keep up with 50 earth science journals, geology, glaciology, geophysics, 
And uh, I see these challenges. And they're difficult to disprove because you've got to go out there in the field and examine things. Take a look for yourself. And who has the time to do that? So it's really difficult to enjoy some of the numerous challenges. This is just a quick list I made. The fossil order, origin of evaporites, radiometric dating, origin of what's called paleosols, buried soils, origin of so-called reefs, ice ages, origin of coal and oil, and hundreds more. In order to uh, give good answers to these challenges, we need a sophisticated model of the flood. Therefore, we can use that as a basis to explain all these things and also challenge evolution in the process. There's five flood model options out there. Walter Brown's hydroplate model, the catastrophic plate tectonics model, and the impacts followed by uh, differential vertical tectonics model. And I have two more options, none of the above or parts of two or more. We're still working on them. We have a lot to go in this. Also, in, 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 in learning more about the flood and figuring out where rocks are part of the flood and all that, we need to know where the, uh, the pre-flood flood boundary is. Also, we need to know the upper boundary, flood, post-flood boundary. I've worked on these things for years and so I have lots of ideas out. I published most of them. And it helps to know for, it helps to know about the sediments. That's what this talk is about. Let's get down to basics, the sediments. What are the sediments? They were laid down by water. Now, some uh, secular scientists say that some were laid down by wind, but you can show that that is not true. You know, sediments include the sedimentary rocks on the continent. There aren't any sedimentary rocks uh, out in the ocean. There's sediments. They're not quite consolidated, turned to rock. So understanding the sediments, the bulk sediments, tells us a lot. And that's what this talk is about, starting with the ocean. So it, it, what we've, this is part of a research project that's been going on two years between three of us. So because of the secular scientists, the way they've uh, analyzed the ocean sediments, we have to divide the, the sediments at the uh, shoreline, oceans and continents. And we'll deal just with bulk sediments. You know, we don't care about the geological column or any uh, uh, claims made about those sediments. We're just talking about the sediments in general. What do they tell us? And actually, they tell us a lot of surprising things that are related to the flood, as I'll get into. We will, we will not regard Tim Clary's mega sequences, even though with time, I believe they'll say something about it, but we haven't gone that far. This is a multi-year research project we're involved in. So I will deduce the origin and meaning of the ocean sediments first. Where are they? How did they get there? And then we're working on the continental sediments or sedimentary rocks that are left. And uh, so they've been estimating the amount of sediments in the oceans for 20-some years. It's called the GlobeSed Project, and it has three estimates that they've published. The latest is published by Stromy et al. in 2019 in the journal which is called G-Cubed, which stands for Geochemistry, Geophysics, and Geosystems. It's a journal of the uh, American Geophysical Union. And from our point of view, they, they look accurate. They, they discovered 30% more sediments because they found out that some deep areas were deeper even, so they had to include more sediments in these real deep areas. And also they got hard to uh, estimate areas like around the Antarctic uh, continental shelf and the Arctic continental shelf. And they do this by seismic methods where they determine where the igneous rocks are and the metamorphic rocks below and then the sediments on top. That's how they estimate the sediments. So it's such a good estimate that that impressed us that we've been taking this <laughs> into the flood. So where are the sediments? This is the latest uh, iteration from Stromy et al., 2019. And you can see the color code for the depths in meters, thousands of meters. So the blue is hardly anything. You can see the, most of the ocean has hardly any sediments, hardly any. 
And then you get up into the green, which is 10,000 meters, which is 33,000 feet. Or you get up above 15,000 meters, which is about 50,000 feet. And look where, where those green and uh, reddish areas are, like the Gulf of Mexico. We all know that there's a lot of sediments there. But along the east coast of the U.S., off the Arctic, in the Arctic Ocean, we, uh, surprisingly, there's a huge thickness of sediments well over 15,000 meters off northwest Canada, and this that you can barely see off of uh, Siberia. And this strange one in the, what's called the Barents Sea right in here, and then the uh, Bay of Bengal, and the uh, thick sediments in what's called the Weddell Sea uh, off of Antarctica. And here's a little cross section to show this. You can see that the main sediments, uh, there's hardly any sediments in the ocean, this uh, line right down here, see my cursor shows up, does it? No. I know. I, I haven't gotten around to fixing that. I'm computer challenged, so I, <laughs> I, I can barely get these, these PowerPoints together. But anyway, you can see a cross section and across the Atlantic. And here's where the thick sediments are right in here. The scale of this, this is 15,000 meters deep of sediment in this big trough. It's called the Baltimore Canyon, right at parallel to the coast. And the continental shelf, which is really flat, and the continental slope, which drops off, are right above it. Now, they're close to the continent. That would give you maybe an idea. Maybe they originated from the continent. Oh, okay. Same thing in Africa here. We've developed a lot of cross-sections, which I'll get into, but this is the, res uh, the results of Stromy uh, province area, the volume and the mean thickness. The total oceans are an average mean thickness of 927 meters. The margins have an average of 3,044 meters. The deep ocean has an average of 404 meters. And in between, it's 2,189 meters average depth and and so that's what the the globe said project has resulted uh, found and we have several cross sections and i'm only going to show you the ones uh from the uh through the gulf of mexico and off the east coast of the u.s through these green areas which are you can see this color scale oh they got a different color scale here. We should have the same color scale as I showed you earlier. But anyway, the reddish areas are the deep areas, like the Gulf of Mexico out in here. Anyway, here's one cross section. This line right here, this vertical line you see at about 600 kilometers is the shoreline. This is the Gulf of Mexico. This is Texas uh, out to the left of that line. Very thick sediments resulting from runoff coming from the western Appalachians and the eastern Rockies converging and moving down and just piling up thick sediments down there. You get into the Gulf of Mexico, the shelf is really flat, and it gets down to 15,000 meters. And here's the, uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Here's the Yucatan Peninsula. So that's uh, a line going through the Gulf of Mexico. Offshore of Georgia, it looks like this. It's, you know, flat continental shelf. It flat, as it slowly deepens as you go out, but it's really long. It's, it's, it's a mysterious feature. Then you got this right in here, which is the Blake Plateau. Then it drops off the continental slope into the deep ocean. And that's because you have this plateau here. Now, this continental shelf, like I said, is very flat, and it goes out, and then suddenly you have a drop-off. That's a real unique profile, as I will make a point. So, and here's the, uh, it has two drop-offs, a little one here and a little one there because you have this plateau in here. We go up off of New Jersey, a lot of sediments along the coastal areas of New Jersey, and then you, you go offshore, you get down to 15,000 meters of sediment, and then it kind of thins towards the ocean. So those are cross-sections. The sediment is next to the continents. What is the origin of the ocean sediments? We've, we've gone through every possibility. We determined they're not pre-flood 
or early flood. They're late from the late flood runoff or post-flood. Late flood runoff. As the continents were coming up and the, and the water was running off at high speeds in areas, eroding a lot of the continents. How much erosion? Well, the ocean sediments will tell us how much erosion we had in the last half of the flood. We discovered or, uh, that I, I don't believe in any post-flood catastrophes except the Ice Age. Now, there's some creationists that believe in these post-flood catastrophes, and I have a whole e-book on it in my website that Sylvia quoted to you. And then there's normal post-flood processes for 4,500 years since the flood using the Masoretic text. Septuagint would say the flood was 5,300 years, but... The, that's not a, a big deal for this discussion. Anyway, here's this geological column that many of you have seen in the names. And this up in here is the Cenozoic. Lots, many creationists, or I should say some, I think there's not that many, but I, I'm not out to meet a lot of them too much. They believe this is post-flood, and the flood-post-flood boundary is at the, it's called the KT, the Cretaceous Tertiary, or called the KT. Paleogene, which is a European classification for the early Cenozoic. I have learned from studying geology and tectonics and geomorphology and climate and things like this that uh, it's way up in here, around in here, but I'm not precise because I don't think we can use any of these designations as, as the boundary because these are, this is a secular uh, classification. So I've, I've found 33 criterion that says it's in the late Cenozoic. And here I published these in the journal Creation. Here's the dates of these. And I also have an e-book on my website on this because it's important to nail down these boundaries if we're going to learn more about the flood. I'll just pick two examples here. Um, thick, pure coal seams. There's a huge amount of coal in the Cenozoic. And to make... To, form coal, you've got to grow the trees, c combine them into a huge mass, hundreds of feet thick, usually for some coal seams are 200 feet thick of pure coal, and compress it, heat it up, it turns to coal, and you need a certain amount of sediments on top to press it, anywhere from 1,500 meters to 6,000 meters. And then if this coal's at the surface, all that has to be eroded off. And we have a, lots of coal in the early to mid-Cenozoic, and I don't think that can possibly occur after the flood. And then I have some climate evidence. For instance, we had some big meteorite impacts during the flood. I'll talk more about that towards the end. And one of the, one of the most impressive ones is called the Chicxulub impact on the Yucatan Peninsula that the secular scientists think killed off the dinosaurs and that sort of thing. But th that impact from an object 10 kilometers in diameter approximately, uh, hit a lot of uh, uh, what's called evaporites and, and a lot of sulfur dioxide went up in the stratosphere and it would cause what's called meteorite winter. In other words, it would uh, cause a cooling of the, of the uh, globe for about 15 years, which would be post-flood down at least 20 degrees centigrade below normal. <laughs> yeah, well, it helped jumpstart the Ice Age, of course. <clears throat> but if all this occurred, if, if, if that occurred after the flood, uh, that, that impact, that would have a huge uh, problem for post-flood catastrophes. Anyway, what about... Uh, uh, processes we observe go today, like rivers uh, laying sediments out into the continental shelf. Uh, how about these? Uh, I'd call, I call them uniformitarian post-flood options, and they're small. I've gone into them. Very little river erosion in 4,500 years, even if you include the Ice Age. <clears throat> Sediment added by wind, ice, or volcanisms much smaller than the rivers. And coastal erosion they thought it was about 2 to 4% of the amount transported into the oceans by the rivers. Just recently, they did a study in Europe and found out it's about 33%. In fact, 
the continents are eroding so fast along the edges that in about a million or two, uh, if we had a million or two years in the past, we wouldn't have the continents. It'd be all eroded into the sea. <laughs> so I'm going to get into that more. But anyway, let's go. How much of this sediment is from the flood? Like I said, um, we've discovered that practically all of it's from post-flood runoff, especially along the continental margins and the transition between the margin and the deep ocean. However, some of this in the deep ocean has to be from the ice age. So all the margin and near margin sediments I have calculated, and that's the volume right there, is from the flood runoff, piling up in those deep troughs along the coast. Those troughs formed uh, due to vertical tectonics where the trough dropped and the mountains or land went up. And then it filled that up and formed the continental shelf over it and the slope over it, the continental slope. And the area of the continents is 1.49 times 10 to the 8th uh, square kilometers dividing. Um, you find out that the margin and near margin sediments result in 1,500 meters of erosion for the flood. But what about the deep ocean? Some of that's from the flood. Uh, the deep ocean's uh, a lot of mud, um, and then we have the skeletons of microorganisms in a lot of places um, that have piled up on the bottom. So well, some of that would be from the flood, but how much could be post-flood? So I really don't know, because you know, no creation scientist has actually delved much into that massive amount of data on the ocean sediments. There's thousands of these cores, lots of seismic reflection profiles, but as a gold mine uh, to answer a few questions, but no one's gone into it. So because of that, I don't know how much percent is from the flood and how much is from post-flood. Now today, the amount of sedimentation in the deep ocean is maybe about one inch every 2,000 years. So if we use present processes, not much has happened in 4,500 years. Ah, but the Ice Age. See, in the Ice Age, you started with warm water, and it cools from the top. And the cool air is denser, and it'll sink. As it sinks, it's replaced by warmer water. So you have a great overturning of the ocean during the Ice Age. The significance of that is that in the upwelling parts, you bring all the, the, these um, nutrients nitrogen, phosphorus, silica, up to the surface, and you have massive blooms. And those uh, will die and form the skeletons on the bottom. So during the Ice Age, we had quite a bit of sedimentation of microorganisms on the bottom of the ocean. How much? Well, I, I went with percentages here. Percent of the deep ocean sediments from the flood. If it's 0%, just all the margin sediments, the near margin sediments, would be 1,500 meters would be the, the depth of sediments eroded uh, since day 150, the peak of the flood. And here's 2550. I split it in half because I don't know. So when we use ha half of the sediments in the deep ocean, that would be 202 meters, and it's over a large area compared to the margin. Uh, and then we add that to the margin, the amount of sediments is about is 1,886 meters that were eroded uh, during the flood. Let's round it off to 1,900 meters. <clears throat> and here's the summary of that. If it's placed back on the continent to the peak of the flood, we got to add 1,900 meters. That's 5,000 feet of sediment at the peak of the flood that was eroded off uh, during f uh, the flood runoff. 1,900 meters. Wow, that has quite a message. But how much is left? If we add what has been eroded from what is left, we'll get the amount of sediments at the peak of the flood that were deposited early in the flood. And that's where we're going to get in some incredible deductions. I think that some of them are really um, solid deductions. And from that, I'm going to speculate some. <laughs> so, average of 1,900 meters of erosion. And by the way, I've done some calculations of erosion in a lot of different areas, and I get numbers like that. 
So here's kind of a block diagram before I get into that, showing um, this is the current sediments left on the continent that are sedimentary rocks that have been turned to stone. We don't know the depth. There's been estimates. We'll get, I'll get into that. Here's the current continental surface where you find a lot of those dinosaur fossils. And this is the sediment eroded off since day 150 to day 371. Uh, <laughs> the late Roy Holt called it the Erodozoic to kind of make it blend into the geological column, the Cenozoic, the Mesozoic, the Paleozoic. To us, that's the Erodozoic. Recessive stage erosion equals about 1,900 meters. I believe this is a very solid result, very solid. So some erosional calculations I have made, 6,000 meters for the central Appalachians, 2,400 meters in Namibia, Africa, southwest Africa, 1,600 meters southeast England, 4,200 to 5,100 meters northwest Colorado Plateau. We're still working on central Montana around Great Falls, and we're getting numbers around 2,000 meters. There's at least five ways to determine how much sediment has been eroded from an area, these five ways. And the literature estimate gives you big numbers too. Here's some uh, values from the literature. The average erosion of the Colorado Plateau, which is about 135,000 square miles in the southwest United States, is 2,500 to 5,000 meters. Phew, that's huge. Southern Arizona, at least 1,600 meters have been eroded. Southern Rocky Mountains, foothills of Canada, 2,000 meters. The Flinders Range of South Australia, 6,000 meters. Southern Africa, 1,000 to 3,000 meters. That's close to what I found in, for N Namibia. And there's some big impact structures, one in South Africa called the Redefort Impact. And they estimate that there was 8,000 to 11,000 meters above or that was eroded in that area, exposing the middle portion of that impact. And in southern Ontario, 5,000 meters. Now these two, Vredefort and Sudbury, are on shields, continental shields called cratons in geology, indicating that the cratons had a lot of sediment at one time that was eroded during the uh, recessive stage of the flood. And talking about the stages of the flood, how many have seen this diagram that I've given before, published, and not too many? It's kind of a summary of uh, Taz Walker's biblical geological classification straight from the flood. We don't care about the geological column. And so, he, did, you know, all floods, you know, I forecast floods, flash floods in my career with the National Weather Service. Anyway, you have a flooding stage where the flood rises, reaches a peak, and then a retreating stage, two stages of the flood. But you can divide the flood up into subdivisions called phases. And um, there's five phases. Now, phase one is the beginning of the flood. That is probably the most violent, where the mechanisms of the flood, the fountains of the great deep, and the uh, windows of heaven being opened. Two mechanisms. And there's a period there in the Hebrew Bible then it says it rained 40 days and 40 nights. In other words, the um, opening of the windows of heaven is not necessarily the rain. But those two mechanisms together resulted in the rain. And it was probably very violent, and you had probably a rapid rise, like with a flash flood you know, coming down a canyon. It's a rapid rise to start with, not a wall of water like some people imagine a flash flood, but a rapid rise. And then after the rapid rise, it kind of settles down to a gradual rise. And I would say, I say that's phase two. It's called the prevailing. The, the Bible says it, it prevailed, the uh, waters prevailed. Then in 150 days, the fountains and windows were shut, the ark ground. So most commentators that study the, the account of the flood in the Bible, which can be difficult to figure out the chronology, by the way, feel it's the peak of the floods of day 150. That'd be stage three, the peak. Now, I don't know what happened at this. Uh, Taz Walker thought it was maybe 60 days, but I said, no, that's a, that's a guess. And I, I don't know. I think it's a lot shorter than that. But regardless, we don't really pay much attention to the peak. But you went from depositing sediment to eroding the top off. See the big picture? 
And then when you're eroding it off during the retreating stage, uh, the whole globe was covered by water. <clears throat> and you had big currents, maybe 2,000 miles wide, five miles deep, moving across the earth, sometimes at high speeds. And they, they were eroding as huge sheets. We call them sheet flow because if you look down current, it would be very wide and, and very narrow, like a, a sheet. It's like looking at a thickness of a sheet and the length of a sheet. So we call it sheet flow, sheet erosion. And so it would take off huge chunks of sedimentary rocks or sediments that were on the top. And then as more mountains and plateaus stuck up above the floodwaters, it forced the water to go around, channelizing, channelized flow until you finally ended up with the rivers we see today going down through the low spots. So that's the big picture of the flood. It's a great model. I see it when I look at geology almost everywhere. I can fit things into this cl uh, classification just straight from the Bible. Thinking of a flash flood uh, and, and straight from the, the Bible. And you can see it's 371 days. Here, you know, you see some of the events. So, based on that, um, this, the erosion in the retreating stage from the continents was 1,900 meters. And that was, a, that was a generated in the first 150 days, plus what's still there. We want to know how much is still there. So there's lots of evidence of this sheet erosion and deposition. Uh, I have talks here that uh, have gone through all this in the area of geomorphology. And this is phase four. Remember, sheet erosion, big wide currents, and then it deposits it along the continental shelf. So I'm going to talk about quickly. This is a summary. This is a whole hour talk, this right here. I'm going to talk, uh, just mention, I'm just uh, summarize this stuff. Uh, they form planation surfaces. Numerous erosional remnants are left behind. Long transported hard rocks like quartzite in our area right here. Formation of coastal escarpments in many areas. And the formation of the continental margin. So here's the big picture. Big wide currents moving across the earth. And when they get into what's called shallow water, according to Barnett and Baumgartner, who, who ran a study here, the shallow water equations, when the water is 1,000 meters or less deep, these currents are going very fast, 60 meters a second, which is about 140 miles an hour. <laughs> They'd do a lot of erosion currents like that. So that's the big picture. And planation surfaces, it's good to see them. They're, they're actually all over. You've got to almost train your mind to see them. There's not a lot in this area right here, but you go into the Rocky Mountains, and a lot of other places in the world, they're, they're all over. This is the Bighorn Basin, northern Bighorn Basin. And this is sedimentary rock. You can see it dipping at various angles, and something just sheared it off like that. This is probably a dome that, up like that, and it just got sheared off, forming a flat planation surface with about 15 feet of rounded rocks, rounded by the action of water. I'm standing on the other side uh, of it, and you might be able to see some of the rocks, rounded rocks on here, but it has about 15 feet of it. And, you know, after it was formed, it was dissected by a further post-flood uh, channelized erosion and by post-flood rivers that, that cut this uh, gap in here. In the Cypress Hills of Canada, my favorite planation surface, southeast Alberta and southwest Saskatchewan, you have a called the Cypress Hills. It's a flat planation surface, and it is dead flat up there, as you can see. It's been dissected by either late flood channelized erosion or post-flood glacial river erosion. I found big erratic boulders down in this valley here, so it's partly due to glaciation, but notice how flat that is. Anyway, I can go on and on about this, but the big picture of this is if it was just slow erosion over millions of years, hard sedimentary layers that are dipping would be ridges, right? And the soft layers would end up being valleys, filling up with some of the unconsolidated sediments eroded from the region. That's what we should see everywhere. We shouldn't see any planation surface. In fact, they're not forming today. <laughs> 
But this is what we commonly see. Tilted layers sheared off at the same angle. Both hard and soft rocks the same. That'd take a powerful current, leaving those rounded rocks on top. And then when you have a flood, it doesn't erode everything out. It leaves erosional remnants. Like here's a flash flood in, in a field in South Africa. And it left a lot of erosional remnants of various sizes. Well, the Lake Missoula flood also left erosional remnants like Steamboat Rock and, and uh, Umatilla Rock and other erosional remnants. But you know, there's thousands of these erosional remnants on the surface of the earth just sticking up sometimes vertically, uh, indicating that something fast happened, just leaving these er as erosional remnants because it didn't erode at all. For instance, uh, this area right here, massive erosion of the surface, like this. Keep going. Oh, wow. <laughs> leaving those erosional remnants. Now, if this is slow erosion over millions of years, these wouldn't last. In fact, it is capped by sandstone, and that sandstone is so soft you can, you can rub off the sand off of it. So there's no reason why these should list, uh, exist for millions of years, which they believe they have. Well, everything around it got eroded to a generally flat surface. My fa here's ship rock in that, near that, or, or it's 1,700 feet. It's the throat of a volcano. Think of the volcano going way up in the air above this, and it just all got eroded. And for some reason, the, the throat, or the, the, where the lava came up, the conduit, uh, wasn't eroded as much. So it left it hanging as an erosional remnant above a flat surface. My favorite is Devil's Tower, northeast, uh, which is another throat of a volcano. It's 1,200 feet tall. The volcano's way... I can barely see that cursor, but it's way up there. It all got eroded thousands of feet, and it got eroded down to this surface, but left that hanging. And, you know, <laughs> I've written about this. You know, they used to think that was been there for 40, 50,000, a million years. But erosion is so fast on a million-year time scale that that should be a pile of rubble in maybe 10,000, 50,000 years because it's eroding right now. So... Erosional remnants are strong evidence for flood runoff. And there's thousands of them across the earth. They're, and it erodes fast because of all these cracks. Water gets in there, freeze-thaw, weathering, pff, breaks it off. Anyway, and then quartz sites. Um, many of you have been, heard about quartz sites here. There are a lot of places in Oregon. Uh, they're all in the northwest states, even around Vancouver, British Columbia, the San Juan Islands. I've, I've seen them in many of these places. Uh, Central Saskatchewan, North Dakota. Um, <clears throat> here's a quartzite. You can kind of see the, the texture of it. It's a metamorphic sandstone. It formed a sand, and then, that, then cementing chemicals came into that and turned it to stone. But even sandstone has about anywhere from 20 to 30 some percent air in it or, or fluid. But then if it's heated up, 300 to 500 degrees centigrade, it recrystallizes and fills up those pores and becomes very hard and dense. <clears throat> this was found on top of a mountain. There's quartzites on top of the Teton Mountains. I've been to all of these. The Blue Mountains are uh, near Burns, Oregon. Um, the Wallawa Mountains, Northeast Oregon. In fact, a uh, couple of you that may be in here, Vern Vassell was up there with us, and John Hergen, rather, we had <laughs> getting up there. So anyway, this is on top of the Gravelly Mountains of southwest Montana. It has all these percussion marks on it uh, from, from tremendous beating. And you know, percussion marks aren't forming on quartzites today. It indicates the intensity of the flood runoff, these quartzites. And yet we find these quartzites in many areas. The green areas, there's big green areas like right in here. And all on these lava ridges around Yakima, I have, you, I have found quartzites. And clear out to the uh, Pacific Ocean. And in the Wallawa Mountains are just loaded with quartzites on the top. They even had a, had a placer mine there. Because there's gold in those quartzites. They had a placer mine mining the gold at the top of the Wallawa Mountains. Can you imagine that? Until they... They made it a wilderness area, and I had to close it down. <laughs> so, um, and the nearest source of these quartzites is, is central and 
northern Idaho and extreme western Montana. And in Puget Sound, I found the quartzites in six locations. And even up in, uh, around Vancouver, I found quartzites. <clears throat> Some of you have been on these uh, expeditions here. And here's the one at the Wallawa Mountains. And there's supposed to be one a meter in diameter there, but we never found it. I think it's under this big snow drift here. We're 8,200 feet on the top of the Wallawa Mountains on a ridge. You see all the rounded rocks there. Those are quartzites. The largest is this one right here. That was my son, Nathan, who might be here, uh, who lives in Portland area when he was 17 years old. We estimated the weight of that as 440 pounds. I would have loved to have that in my garden, but you know, there's no way to get that off of that mountain. And there's gold in these finer areas. It even moved the gold. The, the currents were going so fast. And here's the quartzites found uh, east and northeast of the area. This is the paleocurrent directional indicator. There's another one that says it's from the southwest. This is west-southwest. This is the two top levels of where the quartzites are found. They're actually found in the, uh, all through this white area, but they've been mixed with glacial sediments in these white areas. So they've been spread clear into North Dakota. And here is uh, some big areas around southwest Montana where I live. In, in northwest Wyoming. And the thickness of these uh, uh, nor east and northeast of Jackson, Wyoming, is 11,000 feet thick. It piled up in some big crack, 11,000 feet thick. And according to the state geologist of Wyoming of a generation ago, he thinks that 80% of it was eroded out after deposition. I believe he's correct. And here's another thick deposit right in here. And there's these, this represents a lag, which ends up in the Teton Mountains. Brent Carter and I climbed up the Teton Mountains for three days and found them at the top of a mountain uh, called Red Mountain in the northern Teton Mountains. I have found them, this is an old map, I have found them way down in here. And even uh, near where I live in Bozeman, they were on a, a flat planation service in the southwest Gallatin Valley, which a farmer told me about when I talked about this. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> They're spread all over, up to 800 miles from their source. Clear to southwest of Manitoba, western North Dakota, and central Saskatchewan, coming from central northern Idaho and western Montana. This is the Teton Mountains. This is Brent Carter from Idaho. Um, as you can see, some of the rounded rocks up here. Some of them were split open, probably from frost action uh, but uh, anyway the largest one we found I found was about that big and I have pictures of it this is all this is over an hour talk well here's the formation of the continental um, shelf continental margin and the land was rising up you know, the ocean basin sinking it could be the ocean basin only sank the continent only went up or both moved we don't know yet it's just relative to the other. You had this motion. And this goes along with Psalm 104.8. The mountains rose, the valleys sank down, and the waters drained to where God put them in the ocean today. <clears throat> anyway, you had runoff. And as you had this vertical motion, you had powerful currents forming a planation surface. The scale of this is huge, 400 kilometers. This is, this is southeast Africa. And the debris ended up forming in the continental shelf. And here's some of these... Uh, troughs that form, and as it continued, uh, it formed an escarpment uh, around all around Africa, about 3,000 kilometers long, and other places uh, off Brazil, um, other places, um, Greenland. You find these uh, escarpments here, and thick continental margin sediments from the sheet erosion, depositing as a sheet deposition. And then what you're left with is the great escarpment. Here's the African planation surface, which is supposed to be cover 60% of Africa, but it's been faulted or folded at different altitudes. There's some controversy over that. Some people think there's more than one planation surface. And you have a coastal plain that's rather rough, and you have thick continental margin sediments. So that's kind of the big picture of Phase four, sheet flood runoff. 
And that formed the continental shelf, as I've shown you some pictures of it, but this is the one off Los Angeles, where it's really flat, and then suddenly you get, come to a drop-off. Now, that's a real unique profile, like this. It's almost like it's a delta, but a delta all around the continents, solid, indicating that it was formed by uh, big, large currents over 1,000 miles wide running off the continents. Now, if it was slow processes over millions of years, uniformitarianism, they would predict a deep, gradual deepening along the margin because they go by, by those little deltas of rivers. And then they, but that sediment spread out along the shore like this, and then it gets caught in a submarine canyon and is sloughed down to the deep sea. So if it was slow processes over millions of years, you should have a gradual slope like this down to the deep sea. Instead, you have this profile like here, uh, generally flat, slowly deepening continental shelf. Sometimes it's, these are 100 miles wide. Some places are 300 miles wide, and then so, a sudden drop off. That is so unique that Lester King, my favorite uh, secular geomorphologist, in his last book, he was from the University of Natal in South Africa, he says, briefly, the shelf is too wide. This is the problem, they see. And towards the outer edge, too deep to have been controlled by normal wind-generated waves of the ocean surface. So this flood runoff created this unique feature. Flood runoff created a number of unique features on the surface of the Earth in the area of geomorphology. And that was all in phase four. And in phase five, mountains are, are, are exposed, plateaus, and the water is forced to go around. And when it does that, it produces other features on the surface of the earth that most of the time they have difficulty explaining them, which I'll just give you another round. This is a whole hour talk, and I've given talks on this subject here before, so check out some of the, the older videos and four things, valleys and canyons are formed rapidly in phase five. Water and wind gaps. How many know what a, a water gap is? Not too many. Oh, okay. It's generally a gorge through a mountain range or a ridge um, or a plateau. And a wind gap is essentially a cut at the top of it that isn't dug deep enough for water to go through it. Just wind goes through it. And then there's pediments, which are planation surfaces at the foots of, of uh, mountains or um, ridges and submarine canyons. These things form during the phase five, the channelized flow phase, as the water's running off, 1,900 meters of erosion. And it's creating all these unique features on the surface that they have extreme difficulty trying to explain. They try to explain it. They have multiple hypotheses on the origin of water and wind gaps. But you know, all of them have difficulty. When you go into them, they have difficulty. Anyway, here's the big picture. This slide is kind of messed up, and I don't know how it got messed up. I don't understand how that orange area got over there. But like I said, I'm computer challenged, so all kinds of these things happen to me. Anyway, here's the big picture. The quartzites mostly are, are originated from northern and central Idaho in western Montana. So they were, big currents were coming across. The mountains were coming up. It was eroding the top. And it's spreading the quartzites down this way. And, and as they get further away, they get smaller and smaller, as you'd expect. Clear back into southwest Manitoba, 800 miles from their source out in here. No river is going to do that. That's strongly against uniformitarianism. And then uh, the Continental Divide area comes up. Mountains are rose and forces the water to to go around it, or, or in this case, split it with, with one channel going towards the Mississippi River Valley, forming that thick sediment in Texas and the Gulf of Mexico. And then another flow starts backing up towards the Pacific Ocean, carrying the quartzites both directions in this case, like this. These should be continuous. I should have not made these uh, so current. At this stage, they would be kind of continuous. Then they'd probably break up into channels. Anyway, that's the big picture. So that's the spreading of the quartzites. And um, 
during that uplift, you find water trying to go across barriers. And it's trying to go across barriers. It cuts, it channelizes and cuts a, a gorge across a barrier called a water gap. This is my favorite water gap. This is at Cody, Wyoming. And this is a Shoshone water gap. The Shoshone River starts in southeast Yellowstone. And by the way, you can't go through that entrance or the north entrance anymore because of huge floods in June in Montana and Wyoming. Anyway, it starts in southeast Yellowstone and moves just straight east. I'm looking west. And it could have easily gone around. Could have gone around to the south two miles and out into the Bighorn Basin, which is where I'm at taking this picture. But instead, it just continued to go straight and cut a 2,500-foot water gap through sedimentary rocks and granite that's in the core of this, uh, this rise forming that, that water gap. There's thousands of water and wind gaps across the earth. And here's a, there's 1,700 in the Appalachians alone where the river could easily, if the river cut the gap, which secular scientists a lot of times think it did somehow, it could have easily gone around these ridges in the Appalachians. But instead, it a lot of times cuts right through them and here's uh, the uh, first of about three or four that are aligned near Harrisburg. This is north, looking north from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, at the first water gap. And there's two or three others behind it, and they're kind of aligned, which is a rather unique feature if, it, if you think it all occurred slowly over millions of years. Then you have these wind gaps, uh, where it's not quite deep enough for water to pass through, but, you know, this... This Appalachian Ridge used to be continuous like this, and it was eroded down th a thousand feet or so, forming this little gap. This is the Cumberland Gap, where the settlers uh, moved from Virginia into Kentucky across this, this gap. There, there generally passes through mountains. So there's thousands of uh, wind gaps, and these are almost impossible for secular scientists to explain. The Zagros Mountains of southwest Iran have 300-plus three, water gaps, up to 8,000 feet deep. And a guy did a, a Ph.D. thesis and wrote a book about it and um, called The Mysterious Zagros Mountains Water. They are crazy where the, the river flows. And here's one quote. Uh, the Zagros drainage pattern is distinctive by virtuous disregard of major geological obstructions. It goes through mountains. Sometimes it goes through and comes back out somewhere else, both on a general scale and in detail, in other words, small scale. Certain streams ignore the geological structure completely. They don't go down valleys like they're supposed to. And I like this. Some appear to seek obstacles to transect. <laughs> I laughed my way through this book. It was so crazy. But the flood can do this easily. How? Well, you got a sheet flow going perpendicular to a ridge. The ridge is coming up and the water is draining. This is the picture. And then, you know, no ridge is perfectly flat, so you got some low spots. And, of course, the water will channel into that. And it will speed up because you're forcing the same amount of water uh, through a more narrow area. So it speeds up and cuts erodes quickly through the mountain ridge like this. Both places. And so for some reason, this gave up. And it all went through here, finally, until it was like this. And this ended up being a wind gap. And this is a water gap. And, of course, the river goes through the low area of the water gap. Actually, pretty straightforward from the uh, flood runoff as, uh, as uh, the continents and mountains were rising. And pediments. This is a pediment in southwest Montana. We have... Dozens, if not hundreds, of pediments in Montana. And here's the pediment, flat. And you can see the tilt of the sedimentary rocks. I am looking north, and the tilt is towards the east at a low angle. And this pediment is sheared off these sediments at a low angle. Both hard and rock, soft rocks, the same, forming a flat surface. And there's about 15 feet of rounded rocks on top here. And here are some of them. Spot, I'd say 60% of these rocks are quartzite that don't outcrop in the mountains around it, indicating that these pediments weren't formed by streams coming from the adjacent mountains, but they came from well upstream, in this case, uh, extreme southwest Montana's 
uh, central Idaho, at least 60 miles away. Impediments form by, instead of currents going perpendicular, but going parallel. And then when you, you buckle up a ridge, it cracks. You expand the rock and it'll crack at the top, like this. And the currents will eat that out. That's where your erosion will start and end up like this. Keep, keep going. And, and then as uh, the waters are channelizing at high speeds down here, it forms these flat surfaces along the edges called pediments. And that's what it, it ends up being like that. And submarine canyons. Now, when you, you form the continental margin sediments by sheet deposition from sheet erosion, and then when you channelize the flow, you sped up the currents, and instead of, instead of depositing it, it cut through the, the, the newly formed continental shelf sediments like this. Water's draining, remember, and it speeds up, and where it speeds up, it, it erodes from the nearby future continent and, and piles debris on the continental shelf that sloughs down the slope, rapidly causing these debris flows, carving the canyon like, th like this. And the valley uh, focuses, helps focus the, the strong flow to form the submarine canyons which there's well over 100 deep submarine canyons, deeper than Grand Canyon, many of them, and some of them very long. And so they're perpendicular to the coast. Sometimes they start near the beach. Other times they'll start halfway into the continental shelf. And when it's all over, you're left with a submarine canyon. This is kind of the big picture. I could see I should have blown these things up a little more. Anyway... 1,900 meters of sediment were eroded from the top of the sedimentary rocks and sediments formed early in the flood. So how much is left? So that we can tell how much was the maximum depth of flood sediments at day 150, which has a lot of powerful implications for the flood, which I will get into after the intermission. Okay, so... We'll take a 15-minute um, break or however long you, you do. And, uh, and some of my resources are over there, and there's resources back there. You can take a look at this time. Yes, let's take a 20-minute break and 20. return at 10.35 here. Now we're going to get into the really interesting stuff about the early flood. Early flood. So I left you with this slide. We've determined that 1,900 meters were eroded off the continents on the average or the whole area of the continents during the retreating stage of the flood or recessive stage. So what's left? When you add them both up, you'd have how much sediment was generated in the first 150 days of the flood. So we're now uh, going back to the flooding stage. How much was eroded in the first 150 days during phases one and two? That's the big question. Now, we've gone into some published estimates, and um, we find problems. <clears throat> first of all, older estimates, which were quite variable, use poor data. And usually it's just over North America. They don't include the whole world. Also, the estimates include various proportions of the continental margins. Remember, the continental margins are part of the ocean sediments. And when they do that, it throws off the sediments on the continent. So we can't use that data necessarily, especially since the amount they added from the margins isn't known. And there's Precambrian sedimentary rocks. I showed you the geological column, um, Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic, and below that is the Precambrian rocks, which are a question of when and how did they form? Were they part of the flood, early flood during creation week? There's a lot of controversy over that. But I think from my studies, um, we can eliminate much of that controversy. So we are doing our own estimates 
and we're going state by state for North America. State by state. We're, we're having to reinvent the wheel, sort of, but it hasn't been done thoroughly. And we're running into a few problems also, but uh, we're getting some good stuff. So here's uh, estimated flood sediment, volume, and thickness for Colorado. John Reed, who has a PhD in geology, is doing the heavy lifting. This requires a lot of manipulation of maps and big data sets. And this is a procedure that we've gone through for Colorado that can be used for any state, region, or even a country. It can be applied elsewhere. And I'm not going to go into this in detail, but uh, this is the steps in the process. Six steps. We a lot of times use the maps available from the geological surveys of each state, get a lot of oil well data, and grid it in these uh, big software, global mapper, surfer, these sorts of things. Like I said, John Reed is doing practically all this. <laughs> so I, I'm staying out of this area. I have enough to do. And we create three-dimensional basement surfaces and then we add all the sediment up to the, uh, the level of the, of the land today. And we calculate the volume and average thickness of sediment left on the contents. So here's the map of Colorado, um, geological map, basement structure map of Colorado with major oil and gas fields. Um, you can see the, the white areas are sedimentary rocks as well as the yellow areas, but the yellow areas are deep basins basins, which are troughs that drop. Like this is the Denver Basin here around Denver. And the gray area are the, the, the Rocky Mountain front. Those are the igneous rocks, the metamorphic rocks that have been uplifted. And we, we, there's no sedimentary rocks in there, so we can't use those areas. These red areas include either big gas fields or huge volcanic areas. Like this area in southwest Colorado, the red area is the San Juan Volcanics. And I'm not sure if they're on top of sedimentary rocks or not. I got pictures of it, but I can't remember when I was down there about this. But then you got these deep basins, especially in the west, 10,000, 20,000 feet or more. So how much sedimentary rocks do we have in Colorado? Well, when we add the oil wells, here are some of the oil wells for to the basement, that is the Precambrian rocks um, that we use. Now, some states have a, over a thousand of these sort of things. So we're, we're using huge data sets to come up with all this. And so when we add the oil wells, or the wells to basement, they're not necessarily, oh, they're, 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 most of them are oil wells, they're the green circles, you see quite a few of them. So they give us some, some uh, ground truth, more ground truth for these maps. Then we uh, figure out the amount of uh, sediments from the Precambrian basement up to sea level. That map I showed you was for uh, up to sea level. Like here's the Sierra Grande uplift in southeast Colorado. And 3,500 feet, this is in feet, uh, uh, above sea level, that's where it is, but it's still under the sediments, still sediments under it. So the numbers are elevations of Precambrian surface uh, relative to sea level. And the Precambrian is mostly the igneous and metamorphic rock of the upper crust, but there are some Precambrian sedimentary rocks and uh, metamorphic rocks that add a lot of confusion in all this, and we, we haven't quite figure out how we're going to deal with that. But there's not a lot of those, so it's not going to really mess up our, our, our conclusions. So these are elevations uh, related to sea level, like this one right here, 3,651. That's 3,651 feet above sea level there. Now, when you get to these basins, you go below sea level, like this surface is 2,000 feet below sea level. So that's what those contours mean. And when you add it up, 
Now we translate it into meters because we like to use meters. <laughs> so these are some of the depths in meters of the deepest places of these basins. Denver Basin is, uh, has almost 3,000 meters of sediment. But you go over here, the San Wash Basin in northwest Colorado, it has over 5,000 meters of sediments and sedimentary rocks. And so when you add it all up, you get the average thickness for the whole state. Now this has to include all the igneous rocks at the surface. So it ends up being 1,931 meters average. But if we didn't use those igneous rocks, like the granites of the Rocky Mountain front and the volcanics of the San Juan Mountains in southwest Colorado, if we just use where the sedimentary rocks are located, the average thickness of all those sedimentary rocks is 2,362 meters. So that's the numbers. And we get individual basins here we've done. And so here's a kind of a summary map of Colorado. This is a little difficult to see. The white areas have been blanked out because they're the, the exposed um, granites of the, and gneisses of the Rocky Mountains of Colorado. And this is the San Juan Volcanic Field. And then the, here's the color code. The blue area is over 10,000 feet deep. And you can see that some of these are areas are really deep. The, oh no, <laughs> that's above sea level, excuse me. This is below. The green area is 16,000 feet below, and so we have some green areas in here and actually up in the San Wash Basin. So that's for Colorado. We worked out the details and the procedure for Colorado and we're applying it to other states. This is Wyoming. Now, did I want to show that map? I have a different map that's so much better looking. Hmm. This is too messy. Sorry about that. I, there's another map that shows things a lot better. But what we discovered in Wyoming, Wyoming is a state that has mountains separated by valleys and basins. And in the basins, you have thick sedimentary rocks. And some of those sedimentary rocks are 38,000 uh, feet thick. And so, and, and we've noticed that the, 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 the deepest part of these basins and valleys are close to where the mountains have risen up, <clears throat> a lot of times on a fault. <coughs> Excuse me. So that doesn't show up well there. But let's take a look at South Dakota. Now, northwest South Dakota, uh, western North Dakota, which I'll show next, and eastern Montana have a big basin called the Williston Basin. And that's where you, there, there's a tremendous amount of oil that you, you know, you've heard of dr a lot of drilling out that way. and. Uh, so this is, gets into the Williston Basin right in here. And here's thinner. This is the color code right here in feet. And this is some of the average thicknesses. I'm going to summarize this at the end. <clears throat> this is North Dakota. And there's the Williston Basin. It's, it's sure circular looking, isn't it? In fact... Uh, David Alt, a geologist from the University of Montana in Missoula, once said or believed it was an impact crater. You know, I think I, I believe him too. It doesn't look like it when you look at the shallow Williston Basin sediments, but when you get a little deeper down there, it's very circular looking. And that's where you find a huge amount of oil and coal at the top. Here is Kansas. Um, now this deep, this is a huge hole, deeper than 30,000 feet. It's part of the mid-continental rift system. It's totally covered up. You wouldn't even know it's there. Totally filled with sediments and volcanic rocks. It kind of looks like an impact crater, but it's the southern tip of what's called the mid-continental rift, but it has a ridge to the north of it. So 
Um, I don't know if it's an impact crater or not. I think there's a lot of impact craters that they overlooked look uh, on the continents. This is Nebraska. This is part of the, the mid-continental rift in here in southeast. And, and you can see it. sediments are pretty thin in Nebraska, except they're very thick in this mid-continental rift, as they call it. I should have had a, a diagram of where the mid-continental rift is located. It starts in eastern Kansas, northeast Kansas, goes up through Iowa and skims Nebraska, and goes up through Minnesota, and then at Lake Superior, it turns east, and then in central Michigan, it turns south. It's about 40 miles wide, and it's up to 80,000 feet deep. It's a huge crack on the continental crust of North America. There's other huge cracks. They're called rifts. 80,000 feet. And we're uh, mapping it. Uh, John Reed wrote a whole a monograph on this subject about 20 years ago. So we're getting a lot of good new data on this. And it's, it's a fantastic. This is still unexplained. How we explain this. And I, we believe that it's early flood. But how do you form these big rifts? Deep rifts. There's other ones on the North American continent. But this is the major one. The mid-continental rift. And this is uh, Iowa. Iowa has an average thickness of 3,243 meters, mainly because <laughs> the mid-continental rift goes right up through there. You can see it's a deep crack. It's a fantastic feature. How it fits into the flood, we're not sure yet. Not sure. Work in progress. Here's Indiana. And this has um, rather thin sediments, but then you get some deep sediments in the southwest part, and that's part of the, what's called the uh, Indiana ba Basin, or the Illinois Basin, that's right. And it's a thick layer of sedimentary rocks. I think it's another impact crater, but they don't acknowledge it. Here's Ohio, and here's part of the, the Illinois Basin right in here. Deep sediments in there, the green area, over 20,000 feet deep but thinner other places. And those are the, that's the average. That's what we've done so far. So here's the average sediment thickness for those eight states right there. So the average is about 1,776 meters of sedimentary rock. These are practically all rock with fossils in them. So we're getting numbers that say that the average sedimentary rocks is probably around 2,000 meters on the continent, maybe 1,500 meters. We're still toying with this. So what's left is, we'll say, 2,000 meters, just to round it off. It's, a, it's an approximation. And then if we place 1,900 meters on that that was eroded off during the recessional stage of the flood, at the peak of the flood, we have almost 4,000 meters of sediment that collected just on the continents, not on the oceans. Right in here. So at day 150, you had close to 4,000 meters of sediments and sedimentary rocks that had collected just on the continents, not in the oceans. And compared to the altitude of these sedimentary rocks, they're up here with respect to the center of the earth, but the ocean basins are down here. And they don't have any. So what are they doing up high in relation to the center of the earth? Some good questions. We're starting to get into the early flood and some of the nitty-gritty details. A lot of it's going to be uh, speculative and controversial. <clears throat> so here's some of the incredible new flood developments. Day 150, average thickness about 3,500 to 4,000 meters. Average for all continents is generated in 150 days. <clears throat> that's, uh, in feet, that's, what, getting up to 13,000 feet average, something like that. So it has to be generated in the first 150 days. <clears throat> and they're deposited only on the continents, but not on the present oceans. Hmm, boy, that's strange. And for North America, the Phanerozoic sediments, that's your Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic, above the Precambrian, which is uh, the bottom. 
may not have originated from the continent. They might not have come from North America. <laughs> Ooh, wow. This whole thing indicates a powerful sediment generation mechanism for those first 150 days. We have to have a powerful way to generate all that sediment and then put it up into the water and transport it to, to continents and deposit it. Boy, that is powerful. The flood was powerful at the beginning. Okay, where did it come from? Here is the extent of what's called the Tapete Sandstone. The Tapete Sandstone is found in northern Arizona in Grand Canyon near the bottom. It's about a layer of 100 to 300 feet thick, of almost pure sand. And you can trace this same sand over at least half of North America in this yellow area. It's given different names in different states because geologists didn't really realize they were all connected. And they give them different names. And up in Wyoming and Montana, it's called the Flathead Sandstone, up where I live. And it comes underneath the, the in, the, uh, in the subsurface below the ground in the Midwest, clear to the Appalachian uh, out in here. It also continues up into the Western Canadian Rockies and up into Northeast Canada. All a sand, 100 to 300 feet thick, with very few shale inner beds, deposited over half of North America. Now, let me ask you, what, what is going to deposit a sand on top of the upper crust of the earth over such a large area? Is it slow processes over millions of years like river floods? No, it doesn't even come close. But the Genesis flood would, would uh, lay uh, sediment over a huge area and one on top of another in quick succession with no erosion in between the layers. That's what we see in Grand Canyon everywhere where you see sedimentary rocks. Powerful evidence for the flood just from the sediments which they claim prove evolution. But we can show that it had to be from the flood and, and it can't be from uniformitarianism or evolution. But then when you include <clears throat> sediments above the Tapete sandstone, which is a, a middle Cambrian layer as they call it, you find out that these sediments occurred all across the Canadian shield and been eroded since. So these early flood sediments included the continental shield. So if they're deposited on this huge area, where did they come from? Well, it's possible they come from the edge of the continent, right in here or along here, but not in here because you have um, other sediments on top of that. So you don't have a big area to produce those sediments. And um, Dr. John Baumgartner has a, another model where he thinks that they did occur from the edge not only along the coastal areas, but off the coast also. So he has a different model than from what we have. But that's a small area. So, and that vast amount of sediments, 4,000 meters, the only place I think it could have come is from the present ocean basins. The present ocean basins. And there's several of us that, have, uh, that lean towards that. When I say lean, I don't mean we jump in 100% and say, this is it. No, we favor it for the time being until more data <laughs> comes about. So I call this the big switch because it appears that the present ocean basins in general could have been the pre-flood continents and the current continents were the pre-flood oceans. And sediment runs downhill, so it makes sense that they come from the oceans and deposits on the continents that since came up. And I, ha I have a, 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 some s diagrams of this to kind of shell it in our mind better. And there's uh, paleocurrent directional indicators in a lot of sediments. And they're determined by several methods. That's from where the sediments came from. And some of those paleocurrent directional indicators come from off the ocean where the indicator indicates that the flow was from the current oceans onto the continents in some areas. That's a data set I need to investigate a lot more. It implies the continental crust was once lower than the present ocean crust. Hmm, boy, that, this is going to be a tough one for a number of 
creation scientists to swallow. And to drain the floodwaters, the continents rose up with respect to the ocean basins, which sank. There's lots of evidence for this, and I show it in some of my resources back in the back, uh, more detail. So here's kind of a, um, a series of drawings, what I call the big switch. This is day zero of the flood. The present ocean basins are, being, are higher, and the current continents were lower. That's your pre-flood oceans, shallow seas probably. And then the flood ensues. And I think that meteorite impacts have to be a good part of the flood. And I'll make another a good case for that uh, a little later. And so here's your meteorite impacts. 40 days and 40 nights of heavy rain. And those that hit the ocean, I mean the, the present continents, when, when an impact would hit this water, it would blast all that water up, and that water would be spread by the upper winds all around the globe and would come down. And that could be your 40 days and 40 nights of rain, by the way. So you can account for it actually fairly easily by impacts hitting the pre-flood ocean. And a lot of them hit the, the uh, present ocean basins, just blasting up all kinds of uh, material. And then when an impact hits the ocean, it, it probably caused a current speed of 300 miles an hour to start with. And it would plane the, the land down, or the continents down, the present continents. Now this is, this is gonna be confusing because I'm gonna go from the present continent to the pre-flood continents. And so hopefully stay with me. Hopefully I won't get confused myself <laughs> talking about all this. But anyway, that's why I have these diagrams. And so the, the sediment's running down into the continents and the great unconformity is being formed early by the impact currents going at high speed across the land, flattening it, forming what's called the great unconformity. How many have heard of the great unconformity? Quite a few of you. It's down in the bottom of Grand Canyon, but up in Wyoming and Montana, a lot of times it's the tops of the mountains. So it's been faulted to different altitudes uh, since it was formed early, very early in the flood. And then halfway through the early flood, it just, uh, the, the present ocean basins rise because they're losing sediment, so they have to rise isostatically, and the present continents continue to sink and collect sediment. At day 150, that's kind of what you end up with, 3,500 to 4,000 meters on the present continents. And then they rise like this. this. This represents the coastal mountains. This represents runoff from the continents into the, along the edge, forming the continental shelf sediments in these deep troughs. By the way, these drawings can be improved. They were, they were done quickly, the last minute before I came here, <clears throat> by Melanie Richard, who also does the dinosaurs and the murals in the Glendive uh, Creation Museum. How many have been to that Glendive Creation Museum? It's off uh, an interstate there. Not too many, it's a fantastic museum. You'd be impressed on, the, on just the quality of that. And she's done the murals and the dinosaurs there. And so it continues in day 371. Oh, and you rode half the, the 1,900 meters off the continents during this process. It ends up on the continental margins. And so all the uh, waters in the oceans, the continents are higher. <laughs> That's pretty radical. And I know that um, I'm going to get into a lot of trouble with this idea, but I don't, I don't jump on it and say, this is the way it is. No, I say, this, this is what it's kind of looking like. What other explanation is there going to be? Where does the sediment come from, if not the present ocean basins? So, impacts have to be a great part of the flood. There are certain uh, creation geologists that ignore them. I've been studying them for 30 some years because you look at all the solid bodies of the solar system, they're just blasted by impact craters. And there's a way to explain all this stuff. <clears throat> and so I think the earth couldn't have been missed. And some of these were so huge, they would destroy much of the surface of the earth, as I will show. Anyway, impacts, 
they can generate the sediment. When you hit the, 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 the solid earth, even in the ocean, uh, a, a 10, 20 uh, kilometer diameter impactor would go right through the water, wouldn't bother it much, blast water up, but then it'd just blast a lot of that sediment from the ocean up, basins up. So you, you have a huge sediment. You'd form the sediments that way by impacts, I believe. And not only that, impacts cause huge currents, huge tsunamis, huge turbulence. And they can, I believe they can explain the great uh, ero uh, unconformity, the erosion by fast, powerful, turbulent currents that c carved the great unconformity, which is a planation surface at the, below the sediments on top of the upper crust of the earth. Also, when you look at the sedimentary rocks, you find out that they're overwhelmingly fine-grained. Clay, silt, shale is about 60, 70 percent of the sedimentary rocks. That's a mixture of clay and silt. Also, you have a lot of sandstone, quartz aronite being the most unique sandstone. And I'll be writing more on this in the future. Quartz aronite is a type of sandstone, one-third of the sandstones, where the particles in the sand are practically all quartz. And not only that, they're rounded. It's a very unique uh, feature, and it, it probably isn't forming today against uniformitarianism. But yet you find thick areas of quartz aronite, um, thousands of meters thick, sometimes over greater than 10,000 square uh, kilometers or miles, and most of it's in the Precambrian to the, uh, to the um, Paleozoic. <clears throat> so they have a lot of difficulty explaining not only coarse aronite, but silt particles. And I think we can explain it by all the turbulence and currents early in the flood that could form quartz aronite early in the flood. So I think this model can explain a lot of the, the, the fine-grained sediments. Ninety. 9% of the sediments are fine-grained. Something had to, to, uh, to smash them all up and reduce them from conglomerate rocks down to very fine particles. Impacts can do it fairly easy. And it might account for the, a fossil order. We have some strange fossil f order to, to, uh, to acknowledge and uh, explain. Now, now by the way, I'm getting into more and more specula speculation here. I admit this is speculation, and I admit that other uh, creation scientists who are geologists will disagree with me. Some will agree. For instance, if, if you know anything about the geological column, the Paleozoic is practically all marine creatures, which we'd expect uh, the early flood deposited in the ocean, the, the oceans before the flood. Then you get it up into dinosaurs in the Mesozoic and then mammals in the Cenozoic. I think this is a general order. I, I believe in general order of the geological column with, with exceptions in all this. And where did the dinosaurs come uh, uh, to be deposited on the marine uh, fossils in the Paleozoic? Well, I think they might have come from the west in, the, in some... Uh, area to the west, I, I'll just think of western uh, North America here, and uh, out there from currents coming from the west to east, and they, they, they caught a, a whole ecosystem of dinosaurs and, and flowering plants with them, by the way, and diatoms. They all come in in the mid-Mesozoic, and they, they aren't there in the Paleozoic and the er early Mesozoic. And suddenly they're there above the marine creatures, and they could have come from off the oceans, deposited. And finally, mammals come from some may mountainous areas and people deposited on the very top sediments that were roded off after, uh, later in the flood. That's probably why we don't find many, if any, human fossils because they, they got re-eroded from the top of the sediments, pulverized, and now the, the molecules are found on the continental shelf. Anyway, this is... This is leading to some pretty spectacular ideas. Some solid. I think the approximately 4,000 meters is a very solid deduction from the, where the sediments are. After that, we get into less solid 
uh, evidence and interpretations, which <laughs> are going to get us in a lot of trouble. As John Reed says that uh, he doesn't want to, um, when we talk about these various issues, I don't want to jump off that bridge yet. <laughs> anyway, we have a lot of fun doing all this. As impacts, uh, I mean, excuse me, as evidence for impacts and that they need to be considered in any flood model, any flood model, the Vredefort impact in South Africa is believed to be 250 to 300 kilometers in diameter. The impactor would be 28 kilometers in diameter. By the way, you can work through all this. There's these worksheets where you specify certain things like the average speed um, and um, the angle that hits the earth and a lot of these things. So I've done this, and I'm just going through the two largest impact craters on Earth that they recognize. I think there's other ones that are bigger, but they, they don't recognize. But they recognize Vredefort in South Africa. So I use a diameter of 250 kilometers. It would destroy 9.5 times 10 to the seventh uh, square kilometers of the surface of the Earth. Um, that's based on a wind speed threshold of 50 meters a second, which is 113 miles an hour, which would destroy practically all houses, uh, knock down 30% of the trees. That's, and this is 550, uh, 5,500 kilometers away from the impact is where you get the uh, 50 meters a second. You get closer to the impact, the speeds get much higher, 300 uh, meters a second. And then you get into the air, the, the, the fireball, I mean, so, you, you decimate <clears throat> a surface of the earth, this volume, 9.5 times 10 to the seventh square kilometers of surface. Now, Sudbury was a little smaller. <clears throat> they say it's 200 to 250 kilometers in diameter. So I'm using the, the lower end of these uh, estimates, as you see. The impactor would be 20 kilometers in diameter. It would destroy five times 10 to the seventh square kilometers of surface. Both of them, and, you know, they're kind of uh, 180 degrees apart on the earth. Sudbury's in southern Ontario, Canada. Uh, Vredefort's in South Africa. It would destroy 14.5 times 10 to the 7th square kilometers of surface, both of them. Now, if we had the same area for the continents before the flood as after the flood, the present area of the continents is 14.8 times 10 to the 7th square kilometers. So you can see that those two impacts alone, and yet they, they recognize 200 impacts. They recognize 200. Just these two, the two largest, <clears throat> would end up destroying practically all the surface of the pre-flood continents. Just those two. Impacts are a big thing for the flood, and they need to be recognized and worked into any model. Now I'm considering that they could have caused the flood or they could be part of another model, like catastrophic plate tectonics, that, that, that it would be included as a sub-model. And there's controversy in that. And I'm not going to get into models at this point. And, but this is going to leave us with numerous research questions and controversy. Isostatic effects. The, the continental crust is light. <clears throat> it's less dense than the heavy ocean crust. And so they say, well, how can the continents be lower than the ocean crust? Well, the thing is, when you do isostatic effect, you not only got to consider the crust, the density of the crust, but you got to cons consider the mantle below it. So this is a whole, whole area that's going to take me months to work out. How does all this affect the geological column? Hmm. It, it will affect it um, because I think the Cenozoic, that's the top uh, level in the geological column, I think I can show that the Cenozoic and the high Rocky Mountain valleys and the high plains are early flood Cenozoic. The Cenozoic that, that form part of the continental shelf is, is late flood runoff, and in the present ocean basins, Cenozoic can be post-flood. So the Cenozoic would occur at different times in the flood. That's why we can't use that geological column as 
uh, precise measure of where our flood post flood boundary and flood pre flood boundary are located. And how does it affect mega sequences? Well, don't know yet, but <laughs> we will jump off that bridge in due time. And what about the ocean crust? Did that, um, did that occur during the flood? Or is it pre-flood? Uh, don't know. And then, and then you got mid-ocean ridges and fracture zones and many other things. So it's going to add up to a lot of issues. Anyway, now it's time for the advertisements. <laughs> I've written a lot of books and there's a lot of DVDs, mainly because I want to get this information out to people, to bless people and have other researchers build upon it. That's why I publish so much stuff. Because this is a team effort. Team effort. If research that's not published doesn't help anybody. So it's got to be uh, published. And the, and the thing is, you just don't publish anything. You give it your best shot. Like I, I learned this in weather forecasting. Give it your best shot, send it out, and forget about it. I can't go back and say, oh, I should have done that and that weather forecast. Oh, I forgot about that variable. Oh, I ruined that picnic. Oh. <laughs> anyway, I'm retired, so you can't blame me for the weather anymore. <laughs> anyway, Flood by Design is a book that des describes the runoff, the quartz size, the planation surfaces, the water and wind gaps. Receding water shapes the Earth's surface. I brought a lot of my resources are over there on that table. Because I have a heart for children and them learning these issues first, especially geology, which underpins so much, so much, uh, I and others wrote this book called Exploring Geology with Mr. Hibb, a cartoon character making it fun for young people and even adults, I might add, teaching about the flood. We also got one about the dinosaurs. Exploring Dinosaurs with Mr. Hibb, and we're working on one called Exploring the Ice Age with Mr. Hibb right now with Gary Bates and CMI. And this was just published. I am really happy with this book. If you don't know much about uh, geology, you want to uh, have it in a chronological framework fitting what the Bible says to the real earth out there, Rob Carter and I wrote Biblical Geology 101 just came out this earlier this year. It's got fantastic pictures and it, how Noah's flood shaped the earth was just written with John Reed here a few years ago. It's placing geology into various aspects of the flood, early flood, late flood, various substages, even pre-flood. I go into what was the pre-flood earth like. We really don't know a lot, but we have some clues from the Bible and from geology and fossils. And then after the flood, and then of course, I, as you know, I'm Mr. Ice Age, and <laughs> this is my main book for lay people, um, Frozen in Time, The Woolly Mammoth, The Ice Age, and actually the biblical key to their secrets. It's been, the, it's been changed. Also, at a, a talk I gave to a bunch of pastors, some of the pastors came out and said, we want to know about these millions of years. And... And the books we have for, for uh, said to be for laymen are really complicated still. So I determined to write a book on the dating methods and various aspects of that for a layman that has no science background. So I, that's the reason why I wrote um, The Deep Time Deception, examining the case for millions of years, just published here a few years ago. And, uh, okay, why is not And I bring this along because so many people have questions. I love this book. It has answers to, what, 60 major questions. There's a number of answers books out there. But this is the one I favor from Creation Ministries International. Anyway, I'm open for questions and answers. Anyway, take a look at my resources over there. And um, now we're open for questions and answers. And I can uh, start walking around.